Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Marge Simmons. Marge Simmons retired from civil service at the home of Army Aviation at Fort Rucker, Alabama in January 2011 after 36 years of service. She was a garrison manpower chief in the resource management office and achieved the designation of certified defense financial manager and served as president of the Fort Rucker chapter of the American Society of Military Controllers. In 1975, she joined John's Chapel AME Church and currently a self-professed church lady, continuing in capacities including Christian education director and choir president. In addition to her role as church lady and civil service executive, she also is mother to three sons, one of whom is me. So I'm very excited to welcome my mother, my favorite singer, which we'll talk about later, and a decorated executive from the world of the Department of Defense to talk about innovation. Mom, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Jared. I appreciate you inviting me. I mean, how many moms get invited to work with their sons? I'm honored to be here, and thank you for being such a great son and an inspiration to me. Oh, well, now, see, that's just the kind of kindness you can't help but appreciate. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's dive right in. In your mind, what is innovation? Well, I think that innovation is using your God-given gifts and talents and then your training to um, meet a need and make the world a better place. And, you know, we are the world, as the song says. Yes, it does. <laughs> so that's a, that's a great definition. I love it. The, the meeting the need, making the world a better place, all of that is, is just fundamental to kind of who you are as a person. And I think it's important to sort of unpack it piece by piece for people because there's elements in there that can really be of service to folks. So let's start with meeting a need. How do you define a need? What makes something jump out to you as a need? Well, to me, a basic need is anything that would prevent you from doing what you need to do, even on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, like a need can be as, as fundamental as I don't have any gas in the car, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing right. from a personal perspective. And it could be for a company. I don't have enough people to accomplish my mission. Right. At church, it's like um, mm, we don't have a, a, a preacher and we don't have enough offerings coming in. Right. So it's anything that blocks you from accomplishing your mission whatever the case may be, personal, business, or otherwise. Mm. Well said, well said. And then as you talk about a need, it kind of opens up the door to thinking about metrics or kind of how you know that need has been met. And so in your examples, you know, you got the little indicator on the gas tank that says, oh, you're at F now, right? You need a preacher, you get a preacher. But the, the sort of shades of gray around, okay, we need more money in your church, church or business or whatever. We need more money or more people. How do you think about how much is enough? Can I just tie in the army? Please, please. <laughs> so with, with the army, in terms of a, a need, mm -hmm. you would rarely hear anybody say, I have enough money to accomplish the mission. Right. Like the one program that I worked on, the review and analysis, it had the metrics laid out of where we should be in terms of accomplishing the mission. Let's say if we needed personnel. Mm -hmm. So we had a document that showed the requirements that we needed, but it also showed the authorizations, which could be very different. Right. So we had metrics in terms of when you compare the number of people you had to what you should be accomplishing in your mission and the functions that were assigned to you. Mm -hmm. So let's say we were to accomplish 70% of the requirement. Right. 
because if we had full staffing, we could do 100%. Mm -hmm. So, and then if we had a metric that said that I'm going to let you do a deviation of like 3% of that, mm -hmm. that keeps you in your performance level. So you, you get sort of a cushion or yeah. a bit of a window for performance mm -hmm. around that metric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A little wiggle room in that review and analysis. And I know these are old terms to the, today's world, but the basis for them are, are the same, basically. Right. So that's the, the review and analysis is where General uh, Parker, who was called uh, Mr. Army Aviation, hmm. He would talk about how the performance went and he wanted the, the real picture. And he had the saying, bad news doesn't get better with age. Mm, that's so true. So as we're, as we're all looking at our, <laughs> at our needs in terms of how we're going to accomplish the mission, we've got to get at it right away right. and have that, that kind of approach. Right. And that sort of speaks to a bias for action. If you talk about bad news not getting better with age. You want people to surface the information sooner rather than later so you can make the decisions and start to address it in a reasonable time frame versus, Absolutely. you know, if you don't get the information, you can't make the decisions needed to change the trajectory of the organization in, in an organization as large as the Department of the Army. Mm -hmm. I can imagine getting that information up quickly is, is really important for innovation or day-to-day -day operations. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I worked on the garrison side of the house and we were the logistics support people. I was in resource management. Mm. And so when you think about it, you know, you see the mission as protecting the whole country, mm -hmm. but then you have to look at it on the ground, in the trenches. That's where the fixes are. That's where the knowledge is to keep innovative thoughts flowing. Right. So that's, that's one of the things that I think help in terms of timeliness and, and just meeting the mission is uh, the way that we were able as resource managers mm -hmm. to keep the people in the trenches armed and not just with weapons, Right. But the people who were supporting uh, as a manpower chief and my team, we were able to keep them staffed to the point that they needed to be as well as trained mm -hmm. for what they needed to do. Mm -hmm. That's such a great point. And, and I've just finished reading a, a biography about President Eisenhower, and it struck me how the high level of importance he placed on the garrison and that side of the house yeah. and how that side of the house can win wars and make a difference between, you know, success and failure in mission. Yeah. The importance of what you do and what you did, how do you kind of make those big decisions and make those allocations that are, that have such high implications? How do you, how did you go about sort of thinking through those things? Well, the allocations actually were mandated from DOD. Mm -hmm. to DA and on down, right. but we were required to justify, you know, what, what we needed in terms of allocations, right? which tied in to BRAC, base realignment and closure programs, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So we had to tell our story in a way that we could sell the fact that, I mean, aviation has to be one of your top priorities and we need this number of people to do, you know, the things that need to be done to accomplish the mission. Well, I may have forgotten a few of the terminologies or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> but I still can get a little uh, worked up about those times when it's the end of the year, right? Uh, the fiscal year when you're trying to get things lined up and, and those kinds of things. But we knew the mission of the installation, and we just had to present that in a way mm -hmm. that showed that it fit right into the very core of protecting our nation. Even people who, who were, I mean, taxi drivers or right. putting the grass, uh, the staff there, like one of the first studies I worked on was with uh, the Department of Public Works, where I interviewed people who, who cut grass and, and did other things like that, that people just take for granted. Right. 
Right. But there are standards even for that on the airfields and things like that. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. There's so many analogs to that in terms of there are people doing tasks and doing work that are critical to the mission, but aren't necessarily high profile. Yeah. And making sure that you can, within that allocation, find, create, and articulate the justification for that is, uh, is an important skill. And it really undercuts an organization's ability to operate and innovate when those roles aren't fully appreciated and their connection to success isn't well articulated. So I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of the way you, you thought about how to take even the people mowing the grass and connect them to the, to the mission. Yeah, I think that was very important to motivate people to know that you're not just out here performing a a task that some may think is menial, but you have an integral part in the success of the whole army or the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is almost common sense kinds of things all the way to back home. Right. I think that I learned a lot, and I think all of us learn a lot, especially if you have more than one. A child, everybody's different and everybody responds differently and they're motivated differently. Mm. I only had three, you know, with you being the firstborn, you could probably write your own book and then (laughs) Brett could write his own book because he's the middle son and then Chad is the youngest. Right. And I think once you see people from where they are, you're able to motivate them in a different way. My mother had a way of motivating us, and it was very direct. It's like, you know, just do what I, I said kind of thing. Right. And in terms of innovation, she came about in a time where she had to do things, you know, like overcome a lot of obstacles. Right, right. She was born in 1927. That's right, 1927. In rural Southeast Alabama. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I've seen her uh, wash clothes and, and wash pots and things like that. And then your your great grandmother, Granny, mm-hmm. born in 1907. And you can imagine how that must have been. And Granny was never employed anywhere. <laughs> that's so amazing. <laughs> she, she just did her work for her family. And then my dad was born in 1910. Uh, he worked in the fields. And he uh, had asthma with the dust and all that. Right, yeah. I'm saying all that to kind of compare it to what we're doing today in terms of our values and, mm-hmm. and wanting everything kind of on a silver platter or whatever. But it all kind of ties to also the fact that they were innovative in a way to work around all the prejudice now, you know, people talk about prejudice now. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is a whole different, whole yeah. different level. Absolutely. Different, yeah. Absolutely. That's so right. they were very innovative in working through that and that kind of thing. And that is something that I look back at that they had these tasks, like we were discussing, that seemed to be menial, mm-hmm. but they were part of the foundation of, um, who I am and across the world, actually, a lot of people were very similar, right? Uh, very similar situations around the world. Yeah. Just to think about the day to day existence of a black woman or a black man in rural Southeast Alabama, <laughs> everything from education to work opportunities to, you know, having to be present for the family and take care of the family and all those things, you know, you don't understand why and what you know, is going on and all that stuff and having to deal with that and deal with all the externalities associated with it. Yeah. Innovation is just part of survival. It it was just, you had to be innovative. You had to think about how to create value for people in different ways, because the standard ways of creating value were off limits to you. And so that innovative spirit and, you know, call it ingenuity, call it whatever you want. I think it's part of our family legacy. And part of what spurs us to do this type of work yeah. is wanting to help others, wanting to make the world a better place and wanting to do it in a way that is reflective of values and principles that were ingrained in us by people who had to work this way, had to be innovative, had to be creative, had to work with limited resources and be, be brilliant with those yeah. things. 
Indeed, indeed. And speaking of limited resources, there were um, like uh, eight of us in a small, maybe 1,400 square foot house and not counting the parents. So there were 10 of us in there. Oh my goodness. In, in a small house. And, and um, my dad had made $30 a week. And then when they took out Social Security, he made $28.70, I believe it was, a week. And so uh, my mother was not working at that, at that. Well, I mean, she was working at yeah, home. Right. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> inspiring us to, to yeah. do great things. And, yeah. but she, both of them were resourceful enough that we, we never were hungry and we never knew we were poor, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been news to you. Huh? I have two sisters and she made our clothes and, oh. and then the, the guys, they kind of shared clothing and that right. kind of thing. They were, she was just very innovative and she kept us in line and like child abuse kinds of things, you know, like <laughs> I used to tease her about, well, mother is good. They didn't invent child abuse when you came along. She said <laughs> that she would have asked the police, why can't I spank them to keep you from killing them? <laughs> and, oh so. man, there's so much, so much <laughs> wisdom in that. Yeah. yeah. It's a- and see, we were never like mistreated or anything. She just had her standards. And I think right. that is something that's that's good, even in the corporate or the DOD world or whatever, if, is if you have personnel standards, they need to be enforced and enforced fairly across the board. Mm-hmm. And to just try to see the mission as something that we can accomplish better together than than struggling against each other. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That is so important in terms of scarce resources Mm -hmm. and all those things. You cannot be at cross purposes as an organization when you're looking at scarce resources. And I'm sure that all 10 people in the house weren't always pulling in the same direction. (laughs) But I I know that that was something that was important. Yeah. Yeah. And you had to have somebody kind of saying, this is how it's going to go. Mm-hmm. This is what it needs to look like. And this is the standard you're going to hold yourself to. And I, I know that that standard included, you know, you may not have a new dress, but that dress is going to be ironed. Mm-hmm. Right. You may not have a new pair of shoes, but they're going to be clean and they're going to be polished. And, you know, you're going to, especially on Sundays, you're going to look the part. Yeah. And so much of that is important in the corporate world as well in terms of establishing standards for performance. And, you know, the way you do the little things is the way you do the big things. That goes for operations, but it also goes for innovation. When you're not thinking about how you can do the small things better, you're not thinking about how you can do the big things better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, and that kind of goes back to General Parker's thing about bad news not getting uh, better with age. I was thinking about a little uh, story that I used to read to uh, the three of you Mm -hmm. about um, a dragon in the house, and they wouldn't believe the little boy that there was a dragon (laughs) in the house. So the dragon kept growing and growing until he he blew the top off the house. And then the parents are like, what happened? He said, I tried to tell you there's a dragon in the house. (laughs) So I think that if we don't get at the dragons and and even now on national and international scale, we have dragons of everybody suspicious of somebody who's uh, different from them Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So if we can chase those dragons, I think it's going to help us cross the board in all, all walks of life. As a realtor, by the way, too, I've also learned a lot about people and and trying to be innovative, so to speak, from a standpoint of someone who spent 36 years in federal service. And then you go out here to work in, I'll call it corporate America. Mm -hmm. It's quite a switch, but (laughs) but some things just don't change. Some Mm -hmm. standards and some principles just don't change. Right, right. I think it, you know, just looking at the way you go about your work, whether it's the Department of the Army work, work raising three boys, the work of keeping a husband (laughs) fed and clothed and uh, in the head in the right direction, (laughs) the work of being a sister, daughter, all those things just throughout, and then carrying that into your work as a realtor. But there's always this consistent thing of people first others first and how can I make things better yeah and 
I think when you keep that kind of at the center, innovation just happens naturally because you're always thinking about improvement. You're always thinking about this is the way things are today. This is what we're trying to what we're trying to accomplish. This is how we can get a step closer to that tomorrow. Yeah. And everything always seems to get get a little better when you're involved. Church stuff, everything. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I, I know you're not biased at all. I'm com- I yeah, I'm completely, uh, <laughs> completely yeah. um, objective in this, in this assessment. <laughs> That's the way I actually, and I, I mean, I'm serious about that. I, I feel about, about you and all that, that you do. And all three of you have, um, you just carried the best of uh, Franklin and me around, and that's that's wonderful. And I'll just say about uh, one thing uh, that you were just saying about I'm always in that mode, and sometimes it's not <laughs> well received. <laughs> you know, you just offer a little help, you know, how about let's try it this way. So I think it behooves all of us who are you know, we're, we're innovators and we're fixers. Mm-hmm. It behooves us to say to that person, we, we, well, we have to sell them on what we're, we're offering as an improvement because some people can take it that you're criticizing what they're currently doing. Mm-hmm. And we have to show that it is an overall benefit for everyone. If we'll at least try this, even I- something like, I guess for lack of a better word, sometimes you have to sneak up on a person mm-hmm. and almost hint enough or whatever that they get the gist of it and then they buy in and it's like their idea. Right. There's a saying about there's no telling how much we can accomplish if we don't care who gets the credit. Mm, so true. I think being born and raised in the South helps with that approach. Because there's a lot to being able to just kind of allow folks to kind of come along and, and think about things. And, you know, you just nudge them a little bit. And, but it takes patience mm-hmm. and it takes uh, an element of selflessness. And, and you, can't, you can't have a big ego. That's right. The end result is going to be what you wanted, but you're not going to get the credit. That's right. Having that mindset and seeing things to fix and all that stuff. And I remember from childhood, I remember we were at a buffet and you said they've got hot food here and then cold food here and then hot food again. It doesn't make any sense. Literally, I know it doesn't turn off. <laughs> so, no, it doesn't. So how do you um, keep that sort of energy and uh, approach up, you know, in the face of people who might not necessarily want to change or might not necessarily see your suggestion as something that is, you know, positive? Well, I think one thing that I've been able to do is that, you know how you have to, you have to kind of know your audience. Mm -hmm. So if you already know that a person is kind of predisposed to resist Mm -hmm. any changes that you offer, because to them, it's it's their comfort zone and, and they just don't want to hear it. So I've just taken an approach, just like with the three of you or my brothers and sisters, and certainly my husband, when you know a person well enough that you know the approach you need to take. Mm -hmm. Like if there is, let's say if I had somebody who worked on my team, I wouldn't approach them all the same way. Right. I would just find a way to present it to them. And then if we got to the point where I just saw that they were not receptive to it, then you have to stop being that collaborator and be that other kind of manager or leader. Right. (laughs) I've forgotten (laughs) some of those official terms, but uh, that's just the way. And, And sometimes it is discouraging when you're trying to offer something to help, you know, improve a process or whatever. But you just have to take the personality out of it and and press on and use the approach that that's uh, required of that person. Mm, right. And it takes a lot of humility and I think uh, a lot of faith to really take that kind of approach and, and be that kind of person. We talked about your mother and my great grandmother and other folks and the challenges they faced, but mm-hmm. your career spanned a very tumultuous Yes, and then turbulent. And, yeah. Your you know, teenage years were very tumultuous, <laughs> you know, on a macro scale. Yeah. But your employment, you know, it was the early days of affirmative action and women's mm. rights and all those things were very much in the early stages. And, and you were building a career 
in Southeast Alabama as a, as a, as a black woman. When I look back on it, you know, it's just interesting to, to think about some of the things that happened and that might have happened. But mandatory uh, integration was in 1969. So after my ninth grade year, I went to uh, the other high school in, in Hartford, Alabama population, maybe 3,000 or whatever. <laughs> So I had to leave my younger brothers because they stayed at the completely black school. Right. So it was tough, but I was never prone to present myself as a victim. Mm-hmm. I just felt like I was capable. And so I, that's the way I, that's the attitude I took to school. And that's what my parents instilled in all 10 of us. And so when, when we got there, I walked in as the absolute valedictorian I was going to be of my class in the previous school. Mm -hmm. So when I got there and I went from 10th grade to 12th, I was number four, which I was disappointed in. But what was more disappointing is that the word was, well, she had such a lower class level of requirements. I don't know how to say Mm -hmm. it. They were saying my school was so inferior I had those grades because of that. You know, something like that, it shakes you. But anyway, Mm -hmm. I I went through the process and I went to college on a grant. Uh, The quarterly fee was (laughs) $67.50. And I worked uh, work study. But in terms of uh, talking about discrimination or whatever, just going back quickly. My first cousin and I, we had a little minor sit-in where we went up to um, a cafe in Hartford where you, uh, Blacks could not go in the front door to eat. You had to go in the back door and it was down this little alley. So Frank and I decided that we were, <laughs> we were gonna go up there and walk up to the counter and just order some food. And they told us we had to go around to the back and we said things like, if you think we're gonna walk around to the back and." And and eat this bad food. You got another thing coming. So they <laughs> they said they were gonna call the police. So Frankie and I were in a foot race to get back to his house before the police could get there. <laughs> so that's probably about the most militant type things that I could think of. Yeah, that, and you were a teenager. Teenager, yeah, yeah, and wow. so yeah, and then going into the workforce. It was tough. I started as a GS2, as you know, $2.73 an hour. Mm. And I, I worked my way through after those two years of college, got married. And then I started night school with two sons and one on the way when I graduated. And then I just did what the Army required to move up. Mm. And that would be my encouragement to women, minorities, uh, you know, just if we can just kind of reach to the person within, not make it such an unpleasant thing, but to deal with the challenges in the best way that we know how. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I did. I just uh, worked hard, I had to be very innovative. Yes. With my husband and the sons mm-hmm. needing dinner while I'm over there in class or at Rock Island Arsenal, Illinois. But a lot of women have made those sacrifices, a lot of parents in general. And we just see that the three of you turned out very well. And I'm just thankful I was able to do what I needed to do. Just your outlook on that experience is just indicative of, you know, what makes you a great mother and a great leader, just focusing on the positive aspects of things and keeping in the context, okay, here's what you can do. This is the part you can control and this is the part you can't. And just kind of maintaining that mindset in the face of all the challenges, challenges that you had is, I think, you know, core to what enables you to be able to talk about these things in such a way that is helpful to others. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that. And I know everybody listening to this will appreciate your insights on that in particular. It's one thing to talk about what people should do. And it's another thing to bring that perspective from a lived experience. I've lived through some mean, mean things mm-hmm. because of my race and, and my gender. Yep. So I'm, I'm not in a fairytale world, but I just know we have to, we have to play the hand that we're dealt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, that's always been an inspiration. Thank you. Your skill set 
you developed during your career in the Department of the Army and, and all those things. I've seen you bring it to bear in a lot of different places, the church, as a real estate agent. How did your work experience kind of shape how you view getting things done just in general? I think that um, the foundation of it is is my personality and my my upbringing, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. It was like I learned a lot uh, with the Army that I apply at church or in my realtor uh, life. Mm-hmm. So I think that just um, having the mindset that things can always improve, that the status quo is, is not somewhere we want to hang around. So in any of those, uh, those areas, church or real estate or the corporate life or whatever, I think just to never stop seeking to improve, that's a paraphrase of a, a business, uh, a restaurant's motto, but I won't call the name of the business right now. But <laughs> <laughs> I think that all that I've uh, lived as a child and as an adult has uh, taught me to continue to seek uh, the next level and to do each task with a spirit of excellence. Mm, that's well said. The other part of your definition of innovation was you talked about God-given talents. And one of the things that I I, I find interesting is, in addition to being an amazing mother and a wonderful division chief for the Department of the Army and all the other great things you do, you are my favorite singer. (laughs) People ask me the question, oh, you know, who's your, because they know I'm into music or whatever, who's your favorite singer? And I I say, my mom. And they're like, oh, that's so sweet. No, no, no. I'm a good son. And I pay my mom compliments, but this is legit. Like she's literally my favorite singer. Oh, so one of the things that that you do amazingly well is harmonize. You know, you're an alto and you harmonize with groups, individuals, whatever, real time. And that was something as a kid, I just could not figure out how in the world somebody could do that. Now I understand it's it's a gift. Tell me about music and the role of music in your life. Well, music has been a large part of my life for all these 40 years, you know, that I've uh, been in the world. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) because You you and me both. (laughs) (laughs) But my daddy was, uh, he was outside, way outside the box. He was a country Western singer. Mm -hmm. And so I was around singing all the time. And my mother sang to me as a, a baby and later and all that. Music is such a release for me. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it. But the harmonizing and the uh, ad living, mm-hmm. uh, the harmonizing comes from, from the ear. And I was trained in the all black school. We had a music teacher. We didn't really know how to read the notes, but we could hear the melody and then we picked up our parts that way mm. and so when I'm when I'm with my choir uh, now I harmonize and if it's in a different key I do the melody mm. it is a, a gift and I'm thankful for it and it's a, a quite a release uh, for me and I enjoy sharing that love of music with you of course you're well trained in it And because of the effects of music, that's why I uh, sort of insisted that all three of you take at least a year of music. And I think that has embedded um, an avenue of just getting away from it all, you Mm -hmm. know, getting into the music. But yeah, it helps me in all facets of my life. Mm -hmm. And thank you for all those kind words. Give me five dollars later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we, you can Venmo me or something. We'll, we'll take care of that. Okay. Later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it's always been a pleasure to hear you sing and to see people react to you singing. And that's the, a blessing. that's the piece that you talk about talent and everything for me to be around when people hear you sing for the first time, because it's just, it's just that it's an experience. You know, the fact that you have this gift and you share it so freely with the world, I think is also part of what I take away in terms of how I think about the business world. And if you have something that other people find value in and you can help people with it, you know, your, your singing makes some people happy and spreads the, 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 the word of God and, and all those things. And you do that freely. 
it inspires, I think, all three of us to think about, okay, well, what gifts do we have Mm -hmm. and how can we make the world a better place with them? Yeah. You know, that's very, very rewarding for any parent to be able to see the results of their children making their mark in in life. You know, like the three of you are so different, but you you have uh, so many commonalities, like like with music and, and the way you discuss the whole world situation, you know, and that kind of, <laughs> I mean, I never know which way you're fixing the world, you know, on a, a given day. But yeah, I think that just having, I think, managers, leaders, mm-hmm. leaders and people who are directing other lives or whatever, they've got to have a balance. I mean, you got to let it go and 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 talk about football a little right. bit, and sing a song together and even though Chad and Brett are not, you know, as into music definitely as, as you are, but they know songs and, and they discuss our right. uh, singers. The other night y'all talking about jazz greats from a, a century before y'all were born. So mm-hmm. I think that's just a, a good way of keeping that balance going. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Having that, that sort of release of, of whatever form it is, just something when you're doing the hard work of innovation and leading mm-hmm. and change management mm-hmm. and all that stuff, having something to kind of balance that out as a release, you're, you're right. I, that, that, I think that's, that's important. And innovation uh, with, with music, when you all were little and on the way home, you'd ask me, mama, where'd you get those words for that song? Because you all were noticing that I wasn't singing the right words, but the audience didn't know because I was I was up there being an innovator and then <laughs> I get I get busted on the way home. Where'd you get those words? So <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't recall. That was probably one of the other two asking you that. But, <laughs> but uh that's uh that's really funny. Yeah, it was just that the ad libbing and the, the ability to put a word or two in that really brings the it brings the song it together, you know, like, okay, well, whoever wrote this song did a good job, but if you add these two words here, it'll make this whole thing make a lot more sense. Especially if you can't remember what they wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Your ability to think about words and lyrics and ad-libbing and all those things all at once and harmonizing, <laughs> you know, I think that all of that ability to manage all that information at once is part of being able to, you know, be a division chief in charge of resource management with all these moving parts and all this stuff coming in and out and all these decisions that need to be made and all these, you know, uh, reports that have to be generated and people to be managed and egos and reputations. And I mean, the complexities of being in civil service in the Department of the Army, we need a whole other episode to explain, you know, the complexities of that, right? I mean, in terms of being civil service, and working alongside soldiers and just the political aspects of, mm-hmm. you know, who's in charge and what's being managed and all that stuff. Yeah. But all of that is just different things that you have to kind of keep in mind and weigh all simultaneously. And, and I think musicians have a, an advantage because that's what you're doing when you're harmonizing, when you're thinking of the lyrics, when you're listening to the sopranos and tenors and you're listening to what the piano player is doing and the drummer you know and responding in the moment mm-hmm. that becomes part of your management style I think wow yeah that that really puts it up there on a high pedestal for me I thought I was just <laughs> up there singing and having a good time <laughs> but you're absolutely you're absolutely right it's 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 really something and the the BRAC I, I referred to earlier, that, that's one of the most complicated type drills is that the Department of Defense has, and everybody has to be in harmony together as you're responding to try to preserve your base or your installation mm-hmm. of enclosure. So. Yeah, that's, that's when I went to school and told everybody, my mom, save Fort Rucker, save the Army <laughs> uh, so son's love. <laughs> that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so any other thoughts about innovation before we wrap up? Innovation can't be scripted and it can't be prescribed. So I think that if we could just keep it flowing. Mm-hmm. And the last, last thing is it just can't be hindered by fear. 
Mm. You get a good idea, you got to just jump out there and do it. And you don't have to be expert in the field to do it. Mm. You're being an innovator. Right, right. Kind of built into that is the implication that innovation is sort of like this flowing stream mm -hmm. and you don't have to feel the need to start something or to kind of be the impetus for it, just allowing it to do its work and shaping it and kind of pointing it in the right directions that you believe create value. Absolutely. What he said. That's what, <laughs> That's what you said. <laughs> and then that element of fear. Yeah. How do you overcome that? I mean, you've done a lot of different things in a lot of different places. Do you get stage fright at all? You sing? Yes, I, I do get stage fright sometimes. And I think there needs to be a little level of maybe not fright, but at least a little bit of apprehension so that you don't come across to God and to others that you're so confident that nothing can go wrong. So I think just a little bit of caution when we're doing what we do keeps us grounded a little bit mm -hmm. and overcoming any actual fear though the remedy for that is to be prepared mm. you know and I'm talking to myself about starting, <laughs> starting in time to be prepared mm -hmm. so that gives us a level of confidence that's not cockiness or anything but it just shows your comfortable with what you're doing. Mm, got it. Got it. And it also makes me think of the old uh, start out like you can hold out. That's right. That was one of ours. That's exactly right. Even if in marriage, in, in uh, your professional life, uh, raising children, etc. start out like you can hold out. That means it's all about understanding your capacity and your goals, what you're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and taking that first step at a pace and in a direction that will allow you to complete your task, achieve your goal. But too many people start out fast and furious and burn out, or they start out in the wrong direction and don't get where they're going. But to be able to start out like you can hold out to me, you know, growing up hearing that always told me move at the right pace mm -hmm. and in the right direction and good things will happen. Absolutely. That manages expectations as well, because if you come into a new environment and you come in as, as Superman, and then when you want to try to be Clark Kent, that's, that's not going <laughs> to work out for you. So. <laughs> exactly. They, they're going to want that cape back. Yeah. Where's, yeah. where's that cape you had on when you showed up? Like, oh, that, that was a one-time cake. That's right. Yeah, yeah, nobody wants to hear that. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. Any other kind of thoughts or, or ideas you want to share with everyone on innovation? I'd just like to encourage everyone to just remain open to receiving ideas as well. Mm -hmm. Because if, if people feel like they can talk to you, then what they're sharing could actually spark something within within you and you can feed it back in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I just think this open-mindedness is, I mean, it's old, it's so, okay, it's old-fashioned, so to speak, <laughs> but it, <laughs> it really is, a, it serves us well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as relevant today as it has ever been, I mean, so much of what we, I think, struggle with in, you know, society right now is endemic to people not listening, not being open to being influenced and being open to hear different things. And we have our family text thread. And I think that's, that's <laughs> one thing I'm proud of with that thread is we all throw out articles and ideas and things. And at least once a week, somebody's mind gets changed. That's so true their point of view gets changed. And that's because we've been taught that it's okay. Mm -hmm. You don't have to identify with your point of view. That's not who you are. It's what you believe and think based on what you know and understand today. And that's, that's important. And I've always uh, been very blessed. And, and I was proud of the fact that the three of you, as different as you are in, in some areas, you mesh, you know, uh, nobody's criticizing anyone about Oh, you, 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 you can't do that or anything like that. I, I mean, y'all have the usual brotherly. <laughs> <laughs> I 
interactions and you know yeah, yeah. probably had a few fist fights over you know the, right. the years or whatever right. but yeah. i think that's the way it works though in uh corporate life you know mm-hmm. in everyday life you know we don't have our run-ins and disagreements but you know we just we don't have to fall out about it you know right right yeah i can imagine you in your role would have have had a lot of tough conversations with people in terms of what was going to happen or wasn't going to happen for them yeah. or with their yeah. with what they wanted or what have you mm-hmm. i've never run into anybody that was upset with you as a person right so i i know you you handle those tough conversations in masterful ways and i think that's exactly part of what you were just describing when you're the fourth of uh well the 13 and you know and of course three of those died early but I guess you learn how to collaborate and, you know, do these kinds of things, you know, uh, <laughs> growing up with all those people around. Personalities. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. But uh, it was a lot of order and that kind of thing. But but you're right. You have to just learn how to deliver things that are not pleasant. Mm-hmm. Not pleasant, but progress. That's right. That's right. It's important sometimes to be able to, to do that, uh, to move move people forward, whether they, they like the direction or, or not. Absolutely. Mom, it's, it's been a pleasure as always. Whenever we get together and get a chance to chat, we've covered our usual subjects. We don't usually talk <laughs> about music. We usually yeah. talk a little bit about business and a little about family and all that stuff. So Absolutely. It's been our typical amazing conversation. Yeah, thank well, you. The one part that will be different is I'm going to ask you for some advice oh. for innovators out there, people uh, in our listeners. Well, I mean, it's just reminders because when it comes down to it, we all kind of know what's right and what we ought to do. But I guess just if you have an idea, don't be afraid to uh, speak up, to share it. If it's something that adds value. And then I think also, you know, you may wake up in the middle of the night and it's an aha moment, but you can't just present it like it's the end all and the be all. So present it as a a recommendation and then ask for input to improve it. And then this thing about the the term about thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. I'd also just, just recommend that in this case of you being in the box (laughs) right (laughs) if you're boxed in by something using the term kind of differently sure then just concentrate on how you're going to get out of the box and just just do that and just let it all add value not to just recommend to be recommending Mm. but let's just add value well said mom thanks again for your time marge simmons is is her name I keep referring to her as mom because she is my mother yes yes. but thank you so much for your time and like I said before for life and a great childhood and great adulthood so thank you for all of that and I look forward to our next conversation and I'm sure our listeners are disappointed they won't they won't be able to sit in on that one (laughs) (laughs) well I I don't behave on any of them so yeah they can (laughs) But thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for what you're doing to help your clients. My pleasure. And uh, we will talk again soon. Thank you. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T-L-L-C or follow us on LinkedIn, where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.